another thing about the lockdown, so I thought that was very interesting that they're connected with a lowering of oil price, right? And you think there might be some sort of, you know, engineering going on around that. Um, it's also affecting Apple and Tesla products, right? That's, we, we just had a, a Tiffany Meyer uh, over at China in Focus, one of our shows has just been reporting on this. It's, it's having a pretty significant impact, not just within China, I guess. Right, yeah. right. I mean, again, when you think about what China is short, what they are in desperate need of on a daily basis, it is energy, it's food, it's basic materials. So this, this didn't have, this didn't have a, the, uh, it had the similar effect on tech, it has similar effect on global economists immediately redrawing the Chinese growth numbers, which took down the commodities complex that China is desperately short. It took down base metals. It took down food prices. It took down wheat. It took down all of these different things saying Chinese demand is going to, going to suffer. Therefore, we need to change our forecasts. Well, that might be uh, exactly uh, what China wanted them to do because you and I both know they've been stockpiling grain. They've been stockpiling uh, as much energy as they can prior to Putin's invasion. It look, you know, this is something people don't know. Xi and Putin have met 40 times in the last 10 years. I haven't met with my extended family 40 times in the last 10 years. You know, don't tell me that they aren't close. Don't tell me that this plan hasn't been being worked on for the last decade. They've been working on this together. They all know it, it's not coincidental that Putin waited till the end of the Olympics to invade. It's not coincidental. And if you go look at all the rhetoric between China and Russia and the and propaganda uh, in the marketplace, they specifically said in December, January, that there are no plans to invade anything, right? The Chinese defense minister, I mean, the Russian defense minister said. Yeah. Uh, so it's all out there, Jan. And these meetings and the February 4th communiques and all of the work on the virus, um, again, I, I'm starting to sound too conspiratorial to myself, but I think about, what did the, what, who benefited from the virus and who didn't? Um, if you remember China's current account, basically money in versus money out, uh, was heading into the negative territory because why? The Chinese uh, population was allowed to travel, spend, and invest abroad. And guess what they have to, guess what they have to spend with? No one takes yuan, so they have to spend dollars, euros, yen, or pounds. So the outflow was increasing exponentially. At the same time, the Hong Kong protests hit their zenith, and magically, the coronavirus happens. What does that enable China to do? Shut off international travel, clamp down on their own people, and take over Hong Kong, quietly. So all of those things happen perfectly for China. Yeah. I, it, At the right time. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty stunning. Yeah, and they're still locked down. So their current account's very positive. They're building up dollar reserves at the time in which they're going to try to roll out their E1. They, it seems like one perfectly connected diabolical plan when you just look backwards. Yet, um, you would still say that the Chinese economy is dramatically exposed because it's what, like 350% lever to GDP, right? That is- Correct, um, their, their banking system. Yeah, yeah. So the US banking system entering our crisis in 2008 was about one times levered to our GDP. So we had about 17 trillion of assets. Uh, we had about 17 trillion of GDP. Um, and if you include off non-bank assets or off balance sheet assets like Fannie and Freddie and derivatives markets, it got to 1.75 times. China today is 350% banking assets to GDP, meaning their banks are so much more levered than ours with a third of their economy uh, dependent upon real estate, with real estate collapsing, I, you can just do back of the envelope math and realize that they are having a real financial crisis. Now, the PBOC can fill those holes with yuan. But the dollar investors in China, you know the dollar bond index for China is at its highest yields ever, meaning prices at their lowest level, and they're going to keep going lower. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash free trial yan. That's ept.ms slash free trial j-a-n. So let's jump to Russia. I couldn't help but notice, right, just, just 
very shortly before this interview, you have the Treasury Secretary basically saying uh, to, to China, this is me paraphrasing, look what we've done to Russia, the same will happen to you. Mm -hmm. if you, you know, behave in such ways, right? Mm -hmm. And this was something that was uh, echoed by uh, Wendy Sherman, the, D the Deputy U.S. Secretary of State. How does that strike you? Well, if the U.S. and, let's say, the Allied powers of the West are not going to engage in a kinetic war, what we've decided to do is, is supply some lethal aid, uh, but this, the tip of our spear happens to be economic sanctions. Uh, and the sanctions that we've implemented to date have been a lot of hoopla, but not a lot of follow through. And, and what I mean by that is we aren't willing to sanction Russia's primary business. Two thirds of their economy is, is selling crude oil and natural gas to the rest of the world. Right. They produce about eleven and a half million barrels of crude a day. They export eight million barrels and they consume about three and a half. And so every day that we refuse to sanction Putin's uh, energy business, the rest of the West is sending him about $800 million a day. Just think about that, right? Uh, 8 million barrels times 100. And that, and that doesn't include the gas. That'd be another roughly um, about another $200 million a day. But anyway, we have not effectively sanctioned Russia. We sanctioned some banks, but we didn't sanction the banks that, that process all the payments for the energy business. The banks that we sanctioned Europe said they were going to sanction them too, and Germany's dragging its feet and not following through on these sanctions. So yeah, we decided to go after the top of the top of Russia, the oligarchs who we know uh, commingle and share funds with Putin or help sh shelter his personal funds around the world. But we haven't stopped the blood flow to the tumor. We haven't been willing to sanction that energy business. And if we're also not willing to sanction, so. We, Visa MasterCard stopped processing dollar payments for the Russian banks immediately uh, upon our uh, primary list of sanctions. And the very next day, what happened? China's banking system uh, allowed union pay to step in uh, and provide the dollar payment systems for the Russian banks. Not a problem. Now, have we sanctioned union pay? No. Have we sanctioned the Chinese banks? No. We have historically been unable slash afraid to sanction, secondarily sanction those that contravene our primary sanctions. So Jan, if our sanctions are real and they're not just Swiss cheese, because right now it's a giant piece of Swiss cheese. There, we give sanctions and then on the Treasury's website, we actually give uh, instructions how to do the workarounds. If you have anything to do with energy, any serv energy services or, or a supplier to any energy business, you're exempt. Uh, and we show you how to move around it. And so my view is if sanctions are our primary tool, we better use them. And we should immediately sanction their energy business, which of course would cause crude oil to move up maybe to $200 a barrel. It would hurt, uh, but it would, it would really, really, really hobble Russia. Russian's production is down about 550,000 barrels a day because some of the West has been reluctant to buy Russian crude because of either moralistic reasons or fear that they might be sanctioned in the future. That's having a huge effect on Russia's production. It's backing up in their pipes and it's forcing the Russian energy companies to shut in production. Imagine if we went the full, uh, the full way to sanctioning their energy business just for six months. We could hobble their energy production and really cut the blood flow to the tumor. And we would pay a price, right? Um, this administration already owns the inflation that's out there, whether or not they deserve it. Uh, it was the money was printed, you know, uh, uh, in both administrations. But uh, the fact of the matter is you're going to already see the political consequences of the of what we're what's happening now.